Hello and welcome to MZ Webinars. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have a very exciting webinar today, um, all skills for jobs, which is an amazing topic and very um, apt at the moment. Um, we have with us um, Anthony Horn, who is the sales director for MZ Burning Glass, and also um, Will Cookson, who is the um, uh, sales director for um, a government and communities sector of our business. Um, with that, um, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please put them in the question panel um, and we will get back to them at the end of the presentation. If not, then we will endeavour to follow up afterwards. Um, please um, keep your eyes open for the follow up email that you will be receiving with the recording and the slides. So without any further ado, I think I'm handing over to Will. Hi, Will. Hi, Debbie, and uh, good morning, or if you're listening to this later, uh, whatever time you are listening, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, but yes, welcome to uh, MCBG webinars, that's the BG is for burning glass. We're going to be talking about the Government Skills for Jobs initiative and looking specifically at how Labour Market Insight can be brought to help um, help really better understand skills, supply and demand in an area. I'm joined with uh, by uh, Anthony Horn, and um, he will be bringing to us his understanding specifically in regards to the FE sector um, and how the type of data we provide has been used to support them in the past, which we think is really relevant. For those that don't uh, know of MZ Burning Glass. Um, going back to um, early summer in June, we merged, so we're two separate companies, we've become one. Um, our mission is to use labour market data to, to better connect people, um, to inform education and employers within the context of regional or local economies. And we do that through the provision of a proprietary data set that brings to life and tells a story of the local economy. So um, today, as I said, um, we're going to be looking um, at the Skills for Jobs initiative, um, lifelong learning uh, for opportunity and growth as its uh, um, subtitle um, is. Um, and we're going to, just to start, I think, just to get everyone up to speed, just go through the basics um, and look at how that's evolved since the release of the uh, white paper, the FE white paper in January of this year, which came out via uh, Department for Education. So the aims are to strengthen the links between employers, further education providers, which includes independent training providers as well, um, put employers at the heart of defining local skills needs and um, it also opens up and explores and tests a new role for chambers of commerce in regards to that voice of employers and representing uh, businesses. Um, obviously working with local colleges and with employers, um, the, the broad remit is to support people to get the skills that we need within our economy. Um, obviously the bigger challenge is around increasing productivity and supporting growth industries or sectors, um, but also helping people get the technical skills that employers are looking for. You could argue this isn't that different from um, the introduction of skills advisory panels, was it four years ago now, three years ago, um, which again came out via Department for Education. Um, and obviously skills advisory panels are in the mix here, which I'll explain. Um, but I think from an FE perspective, it is quite new. Obviously, the introduction of Chambers of Commerce is new, and this is where government have set out their plans for skills. So why um, essentially it will deliver the focus on jobs and growth, and they, they, they've set out quite clearly how they will do this. Um, as you'd imagine, um, it's key to them to put employers at the heart of the system, um, and they want education and training that leads to jobs and that can improve productivity and fill skills gaps. We, the last webinar um, that I was involved in looked specifically, specifically at skills gaps. So if you want to go back and look at that, that might be uh, useful. 
Um, there's a push to invest in higher level technical qualifications, providing an alternative to the traditional higher education academic route, um, making sure people can access training and learning flexibly throughout their lives. So this isn't about um, just having education up to 18 or to 24. This is about an ongoing journey um, and career support being key to that as well. Um, there are some reforms to funding um, and accountability providers to simplify how funds are allocated. So they're trying, uh, the push is to give, and we've heard this one before, providers more autonomy and ensure an effective accountability regime. And obviously, as you'd imagine, with uh, pressures from Treasury at present, um, value for money is key as well. And finally, support and excellent teaching in further education. Um, the case for skills for jobs, um, essentially, and no surprise, it's partly about responding to the impact of the pandemic. Uh, we've seen, obviously, a lot of disruption, which is ongoing. I've seen some dramatic changes within the labour market, and it's about responding to those changes. Um, meeting the commitment for net zero by 2050, incredibly topical, and also um, Embracing and improving the skills of people across the country. Um, obviously, there's uh, Brexit is in the mix there as well, and disruption caused by Brexit, and how we respond to opportunities that may arise as a result of Brexit. Um, currently, there are significant skills gaps at higher technical levels. Um, this um, is well evidenced within the white paper itself. Um, we don't have enough techni technicians, engineers. We know about the pressures on health and social care professionals to meet the challenges we're facing, um, obviously around building a green economy, but also meeting the health and care needs that we have with uh, an aging population. Uh, across a range of sectors, there's growing employer demand for the skills that higher technical education provides. Again, that's evidenced. Um, I'm just speaking, um, one of the one of the percentages that dropped that jumped out at me on reviewing the papers that only 66% of working age graduates are in high skilled employment. So obviously, we need to upskill people in order to ensure that we can progress them into higher skilled employment. We know about the broader uh, challenges with lower skilled employment, with automation, um, along with obviously um, the fact that those jobs tend to be. Uh, less well paid. Investing in this, these skills at both local and national level critical to improving productivity and uh, going back to that um, the, the post-Brexit um, landscape, that international competitiveness. Now um, they reference um, how higher education, how effective higher education has been in getting technical skills that employers want um, in terms of producing graduates, um, but the challenge is, is that we've not been as effective. So the, the HE system has been effective in terms of producing graduates. Employers recruit graduates. The challenge here is how do we get people to have the technical skills that employers need? And there, another interesting uh, stat, only 4% of young people achieve a qualification at a higher technical level by the age of 25, whereas 33% are getting a degree or above. And that obviously is the opportunity that they're seeking to address. So in summary, employers have a central role, uh, putting employers right at the heart of informing their working with further education colleges and other providers, uh, bringing other stakeholders into the mix. Um, and then we get on to um, the first of the uh, new acronyms. They couldn't be a new government initiative without new acronyms. So we have local skills improvement plans or LSIPs, which will which will shape requirements around technical skills provision, uh, which will obviously critically needs to meet local labour market skills needs. Um, so yeah, the um, LSIP pilots um, went um, were announced in June. They run over this year. And next, and they'll be exploring approaches, and they're led by accredited chambers of commerce, other business representative organisations, um, or employer 
um, representative boards or ERBs to introduce another acronym. Um, but essentially, chambers of commerce are right in the mix there, along with, as you'd imagine, mayoral combined authorities, local enterprise partnerships, along collaborating with local providers um, and employer and provider groups essentially trying to ensure that the whole of the, those pilots are really exploring how an employer representative um, body can drive skills provision in an area. That's where it will be tested before wider rollout. Um, the Strategic Development Fund, SDF, to introduce another acronym, um, will be available in 2021-2022 in a number of pilot areas, and that's to support colleges with reshaping their provision to address local priorities and the again the employer representative bodies need to really help to inform that and essentially um, it's all looking to ensure that government has up-to-date and expert advice on the labour market and national skills gaps from the skills and productivity board so that will be the overarching board that's going to be reviewing the pilots in regards to the Strategic Development Fund and the Local Skills Improvement Plans. Now, um, moving on, I thought it'd be useful just to share where the Local Skills Improvement Plan trailblazer areas are, for those that don't know. So across um, eight different areas, West of England, Cumbria, South Yorkshire, um, East Midlands, Kent, Tees Valley, Lancashire and Sussex. Um, it is interesting in that, and then Anthony's asked me not to use this term, um, but I'm going to use it once. You can see that there is, this is also been aligned with the levelling up agenda um, as well. Um, and it's interesting to see the geographic mix there. Um, and predominantly, um, but not exclusively, there's, a, there's an interesting mix in that you've got a broad range across the country. Um, I think there was some anticipation that it might be predominantly in those areas where they are really trying to tackle levelling up, but there's quite a spread there. So they really are testing those pilots in different areas. Uh, they'll be backed by four million pounds worth of funding um, and the pilots will run over 2021 through till uh, 2022 ahead of wider rollout. And both LSIPs and the SDF, you see I've started to use the acronyms, um, recognize it's not enough by just simply identifying the skills need that's an important part of it but that's not enough needs to put in place provision that seeks to address them um, and the it, there's a wider mix of stakeholders as well that's important to mention so i've mentioned um, leps mayoral combined authorities i've mentioned obviously chambers of commerce um, but then there's a careers and enterprise company, including local careers hubs. There's the National Careers Service and then there's Job Centre Plus as well. And those are all in the mix to ensure local priorities are fed into the provision and how that links through to careers information, advice and guidance as well. Um, essentially an integrated system that's led by employers. So I thought it'd be just useful um, to talk about how MC Burning Glass Insight can be to use to support this activity. Um, I'm going to go over some ground for existing customers that you're probably aware of. For anyone new, I thought it'd be used just to, useful just to set out the basics. Um, we think that we can tell the, the, the picture of a local economy and really address that um, question around skills, supply and demand, identifying skills gaps through using three different sources of data. Uh, on the one hand, on the left hand side, we've got traditional labour market information, structural data. We model that into a proprietary data set uh, to go down to a local authority uh, level and give as an accurate view as we can. Um, then in the middle there, we've got skills supply data, uh, which has been introduced uh, throughout this year, um, in that we have a direct um, source of that data from DfE. And there we're looking at enrolments and achievements, um, including apprenticeships. Um, and then as we go into the new year, we'll be bringing in uh, HESA data, which is HE data as well. Um, and then what we do is we put the skills supply data 
alongside the traditional structural labour market information. And then for context, on the right hand side, we've got job postings, job postings being that real time view of recruitment activity. And it's the combination of all three of those data sets, which we'll go on to look at, that we think is where the value is in regards to what we provide. I want to start with the big picture and I thought, first of all, um, I thought we'd start with job postings because recruitment activity has been the most important measure in terms of understanding what's happened over the last, well, it's getting on for two years, let's say um, 18 months in regards to disruption to the economy. Because we've got a real time view, there's no lag there. And that was the way in which we looked at and you'll have seen this in other webinars that we provide, looked at how the economy is tracking in regards to impact of the pandemic and other issues, be they demographics in regards to an aging workforce, uh, be it the impact of uh, Brexit, um, all combined, how is that impacting on the local economy um, or national economy and how is that tracking in regards to recovery? Here, what we're looking at is something that we've recently introduced into our tool um, which looks at hot and cold skills by job postings now i've set this um, for the southeast so a really big geography i've set the time frame for march 2020 through to um, october which our last full month and i've filtered it by hard skills and certifications so this is where employers have been very specific about the the um, skills that they feel are critical to the role that they're recruiting to. Now, this table measures the skills with the greatest change. Um, so those in the top um, and those that are, um, are green are where there's been an increase. So they've uh, positive equals hot and negative equals cold and it's given the time frame selected. So those at the bottom have are uh, really important skills often very technical skills but they've seen a decline over that time period in the southeast whereas those ones at the top have seen an increase over the time frame and we've got some volumes there as well we can look at skills change over time again this is big picture stuff um, we're going to get into the more specific um, detail of how um, data how job postings have changed when we were more specific in regards to occupation here we've not been specific by occupation again we're just looking at a Sankey chart in this case February 2020 through to October 21 looking specifically at hard skills and certifications relating to a broad um, not filtered range of occupations and you'll see there um, obviously, there are certain skills that just get specified. This is about the volume of time, the number of times these skills are specified by employers, and you can see how they're tracking over time. Where it gets really interesting is when we start to be, and I think this is one of the big takeaways from today, when we look at skills for jobs, when we're more specific in regards to occupations, we can really start to be um, much more specific. And here what we've done is we've picked out 12 occupations linked to uh, the broad area of social work. So this includes um, those vocational and academically relevant occupations, which are not necessarily classified um, as high skilled or graduate level. It's a mix of occupations. So this could be anyone from graduates through to people with higher level technical skills. And you'll see down the left hand side, um, those are the um, occupations that we've specified. And then what you can see is that we've looked at the structural data, the labour market information, and we've used that predominantly to just quantify the volume of those jobs. And those, so what we're doing is we're linking the occupations to the structural data in terms of being able to understand employer demand. So these are the number of people that are employed in those roles so those are the total figures for jobs for 2021 so using absolute job numbers and if we move across we can look specifically at annual openings now annual openings is a key measure so this is looking at the actual opportunity so this allows for projected job change it will allow for any growth um, it would allow for replenishment from things like retirement, people leaving the workforce, 
um, and it will also um, to a it will also discount churn. So it will it will discount churn within a specific occupation. People moving from a local government admin occupation into another local government admin occupation. It does allow for interoccupational churn when someone moves from an unrelated um, um, occupation into another occupation. Someone moving from a senior care worker um, through to a role as a prison service officer. Annual occupations is generally the measure that our training providers, further education colleges, when they're looking at curriculum planning, because these are new jobs that are being created um, or that um, are materialising within a given area. The interesting thing is when we've switched from the 2021 total jobs to annual openings, you can see that the same five occupations make it to the top, local government, um, welfare and housing associate professionals, senior care workers, youth and community workers and social workers. So it doesn't change things significantly, but that isn't always the case. And this means you can be more specific about, as I said, the size and scale of the opportunity. We can also be specific in terms of wages. And there we do see some change. Not all of these occupations uh, pay the same amount. Um, and um, that's obviously really useful context. And when we go back to that question around careers, advice and guidance, this is absolutely key. Um, and obviously all of this data can be localised to any given area, either down to local authority. I thought it would also be useful to take the same um, groupings, um, looking at three occupations linked to social work um, graduates over the last 12 months. But here what we're doing is we're looking specifically at the skills which are in demand across all three of these occupations. Um, so this includes social work, mental health and risk analysis. These are all um, skills that are coming out here really clearly. Um, but where it gets really interesting is when we look at skills that are specific to just one of those occupations so we can look at all three combined but here we're looking specifically at the skills for social work and you'll see that there's some difference um, for example um, we see that social work as you social workers imagine employers are specializing that need for social work and child protection and mental health whereas if we look at youth and community workers it changes mental health comes out as the most specified skill uh, working with children um, and then when we look at welfare and housing associate professionals, um, you see some of the most in-demand skills are including care coordination, rehabilitation and probation. And I think this is the point, the context that comes from the job postings is critical to understanding the specific needs of groups of employers in regards to specific occupations that they're recruiting to. But in terms of quantifying the size of the opportunity where there's growth within which occupations then you need the structural data so i guess the point i want you to take away is how important it is to be able to look at both of these and i think that probably is a good time to introduce anthony um, who's going to talk to us about how um, how regional fe provision goes about meeting labour market needs. And I think there's lots to learn from that that can be applied um, to the activity that's taken around, taking, being taken up around skills for jobs. Thanks, Will. Um, one of the things that struck me from, from your slides there is the range of different jobs and therefore the range of skills that are in demand across typical regions. So while the focus of of recent government activity might well be on technical skills when we're thinking about labour market demand we should always be aware of all jobs at all levels and all skills that are needed across regional economies so we saw in one of your first slides there a lot of demand for warehousing skills and, and, and um, front of house restaurant operations yeah. skills and, and, and those those skills and those jobs are, are going to continue to be really important I guess across uh, pretty much every region really and then of course all all uh, providers in the FE sector as well as other sectors are going to be in a great spot to be delivering to that wide array of skills that employers are asking for and, and that individuals need 
so for these next few slides i'm going to talk about how we can help you to see how fe supply is meeting those regional labor market demands um, both at an aggregate level and also with the ability to dig into that in more detail so for example at individual provider level or down into more of the of the detail of, of sector subject areas so how might that look then here on on screen we see an example of um, a made-up region um, so uh, we've, we've just created a region for demonstration purposes um, with some supply demand analysis so to be completely transparent here we're talking about fe supply in england only for this next few slides so on the left hand side of this slide we see a representation of all achievements coming from the fe sector in this region mapped to high level subject sector areas uh, the red dots on that left hand side uh, chart show the average proportion of delivery in each subject sector area by LEP region. Then on the chart in the middle, we are showing the difference between that supply coming from the FE sector by sector subject area and job openings for occupations mapped to each of those subject sector areas. So at a high level, we start to get a picture of um, how supply coming from FE is meeting uh, demand coming from the labour market. And then the data table on the right hand side is showing a bit more of, of that detail. That's aggregate provision across a region then. If we move to the next slide, please Will, we can um, also dig a little bit deeper. So if you're a provider, you may well be interested in that regional aggregate picture to give the wider context of supply and demand in your local region. But of course, you're gonna to wanna to dig deeper to see where you fit uh, in that uh, in that piece. Next slide, please, Will. And so we can we can apply that same analysis to an individual provider, for example. So again, this is a, a made up provider um, with 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 some sample data here. Um, and we see again at high level uh, sector subject area one how a particular provider is stacking up in terms of achievements. So achievements in the last full year, for example against each subject area and then how that maps against job openings for occupations mapped against each of those subject areas next slide please will we can also then dig a little bit deeper so linking back to some of the data that will talked us through earlier on the the skills in demand for for social care uh, and, and and other jobs we can consider the fe supply demand question at a more granular subject sector level so sticking with health and social care as an example we see on screen here an example of how we can do that so how we can dig down into um, uh, ssa1 data so here the the health and public services ssa1 and how we can see the constituent ssa2 so the subject sector areas that sit underneath that uh, we can see how a particular provider or group of providers stack up in terms of achievements for each of those more granular subject areas. We can see um, what kind of market share that, that gives an indiv individual provider. And then on the right hand side here, we, we see a metric that MZ Burning Glass have created um, called subject quotient. And that's all about the concentration of provision in a particular subject area. So a subject quotient of one for any particular subject area would mean that the concentration of that provision is at the national average. Uh, anything above one suggests a greater than normal concentration of provision uh, in that particular subject. And there could be a number of different reasons for that. It might be that that particular regional labour market has a particular need for provision in those areas, or it might suggest an oversupply. Uh, but we can we can dig into that so we can dig into ssa2s as 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 we see on the screen here let me show you now an example of how we use the health and social care ssa2 as an example so the second bottom green bar that you see on screen here what else can we do uh, at that level so for that uh, health and social care ssa2 again for a, for a sample provider in a sample region 
we can look at the detailed jobs that make up regional employment in that subject area. So down the left hand side there you see the, the jobs that make up most employment in that particular subject area in this uh, in this particular region. Red dots again are showing how um, that compares to national uh, national average for a for a for a for a typical left left region. And then more detail on that in the right hand side, uh, including for example how those jobs are expected to trend in the coming years in terms of employment numbers overall, um, how many annual openings there are, uh, and then things like the average education level of the existing workforce in those jobs, and indeed how exposed each of those jobs are to automation. Next slide, please, Will. So final slide from, from me in this section. Um, again, for, for those jobs that we just saw on that previous slide within the health and social care subject sector area what are the skills that are most in demand from employees in this particular region over the past couple of years so that's the lighter green segment of each bar and then what are the skills that are most in demand very recently so over the past six months that's the darker um, blue segment of, of each bar so so really what I think what those past few slides hopefully show is that we can we can help you to understand how in this case FE provision at both an aggregate and then at a more detailed level is meeting the overall job needs and the skill needs of regional labour markets. Now I know we are already talking to some of you uh, about accessing this data for those of you who uh, want to know more about that uh, of course please do reach out and we'll, we'll share more information on this uh, as part of our follow-up from, from the webinar. But for now, back to you, Will. Thanks, Anthony. I found that really um, useful. Uh, we managed to introduce a few more sec uh, SSAs, subject sector areas, a few more acronyms. So we're doing a great job here in terms of uh, the plethora of uh, uh, acronyms we are uh, managing to uh, bust as we go. Um, I wanted to finish um, up by just providing a quick summary of what we've covered. Um, do stay with me because there's some um, free to access resources that I want to make you aware of as well. So don't think this is just uh, something that you've all uh, we've already covered. Um, I'll go through this quickly and then we'll have a look at the resources that we've got available, which I think will be really interesting um, for you to get hold of. Um, I, I've made this point right from the start um, and I think it's absolutely key that combination of structural labour market information and um, the dynamic uh, data that comes with job postings, the combination of those allow you to see the makeup of your regional labour market in its entirety, but then it's through um, comparing the education supply side inside that we're, we're drawing from the Department for Education, putting that alongside the labour market demand, we think that's key to being able to have those conversations about improving alignment, um, either internally within your um, specific organisation, if you're a training provider, or if you are part of one of those employer representative bodies or a stakeholder involved in the mix, to be able to look at that, I think is really powerful. Um, then obviously uh, using that to inform action is where it really starts to take off. In terms of the other key thing I want you to take away, um, we looked at the structural data, um, we looked at total jobs, but annual op um, openings by occupation is the way to quantify the actual opportunity in terms of um, is that opportunity growing or declining year on year, and how does that compare, compare to the um, supply side output of achievement um, of qualifications that relate to that occupation. Um, and then the final point, um, job postings, really important in terms of the context they provide. Um, job postings have really come centre stage over the last 18 months because they are real time. So we can see how things are tracking. But then if we want to understand skills demand and how employers are, uh, are um, defining the skills that they need, then job postings are key to that. So as I mentioned, um, resources that are soon to be available. For anyone that's registered, um, we'll put this into 
the, the link to this website here um, into um, the follow-up email. Um, why would we do that? Um, because we're providing free reports um, for LEP areas looking specifically at the combinations of data that we've talked about today. So that mixture of supply side data um, to look at further education outputs in terms of achievements, but also looking at total job numbers, looking at skills demand from job postings. And we're going to do that for the construction sector. So there'll be a snapshot available down to uh, LEP geography, um, looking at construction and the different types um, of data that we've covered off today. Um, those can be re requested through the link that we've got here, economicmodeling.co.uk slash construction hyphen reports. Um, um, but as I said, that link will be in the follow up email. Um, do request those. They're two page short PDF reports, but really uh, powerful in terms of the insight they provide around construction um, and looking specifically at how construction has tracked over the last 12 months. So yes, um, um, other things to mention in terms of resources. Um, oh, here's, here's an example. I didn't realize I'd um, included this. An example of, um, I think it's Black Country. Yes, it is, um, but an example of one of the, I think it's the first part of that report looking at total jobs and job postings activity. So the next uh, webinar is on the December the 8th. This is the um, second part of the UK labour market puzzle. Um, the first one, um, you can listen back if you've missed it through our going to the website webinar section on our website. So this is a collaborative webinar with Get My First Job. Um, this is the second part of the two part webinar series. Um, and looking at how employers and training providers should respond to the uh, challenges within the labour market. Um, and that will also link to a two-part report, which I think the first part of that is due to be released next week. Um, and it's looking at why employers are struggling to find workers and what can be done about it. So this looks at disruption that's happened um, over the pandemic period, but also specifically looks at that tightening of the labour market that we're seeing and um, also looks at that in regards to the impact on specific groups, including young people. Um, that will be um, to sign up for the webinar and obviously um, do request those reports. Um, again, those will be made available next week, whereas the construction reports that we talked about earlier um, can be requested straight away. Just wanted to thank um, Anthony and uh, for joining me on this webinar and um, thank you all for attending and um, hope to hear from you shortly. Thanks Will. Thanks.